St. Thomas Aquinas told us that actually compared to blasphemy, every other sin is slight, showing disrespect to God or something sacred. He stated that if there is a justifiable reason and you don't get angry, you are in sin. We're going to have Father Chris Alar on the team today. We're going to be talking about answering blasphemy. Of course, we're continuing our conversations around the debacle, the botcher, the, you know, the debauched uh, presentation at the Olympic ceremony where you got that, hey, if you guys are offended, then I guess whatever, we're sorry. Apology out of the Olympic Committee. Father Chris Alar is going to be on the team to talk about answering the sin of blasphemy. By the way, my name is Joe McLean. I host a radio program called A Catholic Take, where we look at the world through a Catholic lens. I'd love for you to hang out with us. If you like it, give it a thumbs up and let us know what you think in the comments below. Father Chris Alar joins us right now by, by phone. He's the Provincial Superior of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of Mercy Province of the Marian Fathers of the Immaculate Conception, in the U.S. and in Argentina. Let's talk about the sin of blasphemy. Can you define the term for me? Like what constitutes blasphemy? Why is it so critically important that Catholics not just sit around and take it on the chin and be quiet about it? Right. See, the thing that a lot of people uh, don't think or don't realize is the seriousness of it. Basically, we have sin in two ways. Uh, we sin against God, we sin against neighbor. And Thomas Aquinas, St. Thomas Aquinas told us that actually, compared to blasphemy, every other sin is slight. And that's a wake-up call, because it's a sin against God, which is even more serious than a sin against our neighbor, as bad as that is. So basically, it's showing disrespect to God or something sacred, um, or saying or doing something that shows disrespect against God or the sacred. Um, for instance, uh, saying something bad about God, using the Lord's name in vain, um, you know, denouncing his church, or as we saw, acting out um, in mockery of uh, scripture and the sacred sacredness of the Last Supper. Who at the Olympic Committee would have agreed to, approved this opening ceremony? Somebody at the Olympic Committee thought that this was perfectly okay. That should trouble us, in my opinion. What do you say? And that person is this Thomas Jolly. He is the artistic director uh, that was in charge of the opening ceremony. And he totally, in the first time I mentioned how he totally defended this spectacle. And and then the the, the really insulting thing, I, uh, it was almost like this passive aggressive insult afterwards as he says, I'm not aware of any criticism. Um, and he says, we're just worried about inclusion. Um, and I'm not aware of any criticism. Wow. And then he says, and then I wrote or I gave a second homily the next day, which trust me, I didn't want to do. I wanted to, I wanted to be, I wanted to be moving on, but I had to give that second homily because he came out with this, um, ridiculous, I'm calling it a ridiculous excuse, uh, trying to justify that it had nothing. He used the words nothing to do with the Last Supper. And mm. the point that we made that um, I emphasized in that second homily uh, is what I'm calling the, the smoking gun. Um, and that is because the, the main figure in this um, spectacle was named Barbara Butch. And by the way, I don't know if you've heard, she's now taking legal action because she's saying she's she's being harassed online. It's like, well, we, there are consequences. I'm not. Never do we condone, um, you know, if what she's saying is true uh, and how, what people are saying to it. Absolutely never. That's not Christian. We're defeating our purpose. But you also have to realize there are consequences to what you do. And um, if you're going to go ahead and do that, what are the consequences if you do a cartoon of Muhammad? Well, right. you lose your life. You lose your life. You just don't, you got to be prudent. And, and prudence is something that is a lost virtue. But anyway, this main figure, the centerpiece of that, uh, which they said they did not mock the Last Supper. It was, it was an imitation of a 17th century Dutch painting, but actually it was both. If you're right too, Joe, I didn't watch the whole thing. I, I thank goodness. But then I went back 
and um, uh, on, and watched it. And they, 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 they do both. They first organize themselves in the exact position of the Last Supper. There's just no way that anybody could state this was not in reference at all to the Last Supper. And then, yes, they went on to that Bacchanal, um, that, that Greek revelry and party and whatnot. But they did both. But the thing is, she's saying that it had nothing to do with it. Or, I'm sorry, the, uh, the uh, uh, Thomas Jolly. But here's the interesting thing. She posted on Instagram the actual Last Supper painting, the, the, the actual right. painting of Da Vinci. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. her words, and this was in the New York Post. Um, she said, quote, oh, yes, oh, yes, the New Gay Testament. And she showed the picture of the Last Supper. Now, it doesn't take anybody with any uh, brain power to be able to figure out that when they removed that, um, they are basically now saying it had nothing to do with it. She removed it, but it's too late. So many people saw it. So I guess I got to say, please insult our intelligence. Come out and say, exactly. uh, you know, the truth or, or what our intent was. Listen, we may have done it the wrong way. Our intent was to wake up people. We feel you feel Christianity is oppressive, whatever their argument is, which is false, but whatever it is. But instead, insulting our intelligence and saying it had nothing to do with it, the central figure posted the picture of the Last Supper. So how could you say it has nothing to do with it? What a lot of people don't realize, and all this honor of the Greek god Dionysus and then the, the Roman version of him, Bacchus, St. Paul told us if we worship a pagan god, it is worship of demons. And um, and so the the Roman name this, of this Greek god Dionysus, the, he's the god of pleasure. He was the blue guy, right, in the... Um, in the uh, mm. event, and um, they they went on, and, and you know what? Nobody else is saying. Okay, let's even for the sake of argument say that this was about these Greek this Greek god. Let, let's even for the sake of argument. What about the headless woman uh, who they admit was was Marie Antoinette, which they keep pointing out she was convicted of treason. That was a sham, first of all, and secondly. Yeah. They keep pointing out to her insensitivity to the poor to say, let them eat cake. She never said that. She never said that. Let them eat cake. Um, it's absolutely a fabrication throughout uh, 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 history, an urban legend. She never said that. And they kept saying that that she was, uh, uh, you know, uh, treason and conspiracy stealing from the state. And that Thomas Jolly's passive aggressive statement even says, sound familiar, question mark, like, like he's saying this, the church is doing that. So they they're, they're just keep needling. Um, but the whole French Revolution is the state becoming, or, or I should say we becoming God. Um, communism is the state becoming God. But in the French Revolution, it's we become God. And that's what the World War I was, was the fulfillment uh, to end the Christian monarchies. And I said that in that second homily, and boy, did I get slammed online, people calling me vile, that they want to vomit listening to me because we are saying that we shouldn't have ended the Christian monarchy. The greatest history in, in the world was the Christian monarchies of Europe. People had freedom. People had, were able to worship. People were able to, to do the King Louis the Ninth. Their own king is one of the greatest saints who ever walked this earth, and they're tearing statues down of him. It just, it, 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 I said in that homily yesterday or a couple of days ago, I can't even believe we're having this conversation. Uh, we've gone so far. And, um, and so how we've got here, the answers are many, but, but why, why we are here is just, it's baffling. The denial of objective moral truth, um, because like, like I said, they're, they're arguing about this painting. Let's talk about the other things. Okay, first I mentioned there was the headless, the singer uh, being the headless Marie Antoinette. A lot of people are not talking about that 10-year-old child that was up there at the time this man is basically showing his genitalia, um, you know, in color and different things. And uh, I mean, not outwardly, maybe removing his pants, but, but there was absolutely a display of genitalia. And this 10 to 11 year old uh, child is, is right there. Um, mm. th this is the, the debauchery. Um, what about the horsemen? 
They keep saying that that wasn't death of the book of Revelation. It was Sequana, the goddess of the scene, of the Seine River. But that's the symbol of resistance uh, against God, against um, the church. So even if they want to argue about this painting, what about all your other symbolisms here? Um, you know, um, you know, the mocking against Christianity, um, you know, and, and there's really the worship of the golden calf during those ceremonies. Um, right. you know, you have, you know, you have, um, uh, the, the mockery, uh, like not just the, the horsemen, the last supper, but you got genitals, you got the worship of a golden calf. There's a lot here. And then the drag queens, um, are in meaning very dangerous. Would you say their apology was wanting? And I guess the next question is, what do we do about all of this? How do we respond properly? Well, you, you mentioned Bishop Barron. He was the one that first came out and said, it is time for us to actually uh, take action. Now, of course, as I said earlier, we, we as Catholics never embrace, um, you know, uh, rioting or burning or some of the things that most other groups that have been offended, if you will, um, we don't do that. And that's why we're one of the reasons we're an easy target. So we hold to that. We hold to the Christ-like response. But Christ did respond. In fact, Thomas Aquinas stated, and again, this is the greatest uh, theologian, philosopher in the history of the church. He stated that if there is a justifiable reason and you don't get angry, you are in sin. You have to get angry. I was shocked by that when I learned that in seminary. And he doesn't mean angry that you're going to uh, go burn something down or, or hurt somebody or do an act of violence. Of course not. He's talking about the reaction of Christ at the money exchangers. Uh, you know, when the temple, when you had to buy the animals to sacrifice in temple currency and the money exchangers would swindle the people. Um, Christ was justifiably angry. What did he do? Did he just sit in the corner and say, guys, we have to pray? Well, of course we have to pray. But no, he took physical action. And the physical action wasn't violent. He made a statement. But Aquinas says if we, if we see a grave injustice and we're not angry, angry in an ordered way, not sinful anger like the uh, deadly sin. But if we don't, we are in sin. And so the, the justifiable uh, reason here to be angry should be responded to. And what we announced in that homily was an email and a phone number. And, yeah. um, and so we invite everybody to contact press office, one word, at olympic.org. Now, we gave another email out that they changed. They, they, they took off. So um, we're, we now have one that works, and they've actually left it up. Uh, uh, it's press office at olympic.org. Please um, reach out. Make your voice heard. Um, I've been getting thousands of letters. In fact, the, the homily has over a million. Uh, it's like 1.2 million views already, and there's like thousands and thousands of comments. And a majority of the people saying, I wrote them, I emailed, I called. So I'm telling you, we are really making a difference. And I even said, if we could get 10,000 people, uh, and out of 1.2 million, let's come up with 10,000 people. <laughs> we can, yeah. we can do that. We can do that. And um, and so it's going to make a huge difference. It's it, it absolutely is. And and that's what Bishop Barron called us to do. Um, and so we have to fight this. And and then people were there were some mock uh, comments on there saying that. We're overreacting, and one person stated about the beauty of the drag queens. And if I may just make one comment here, this is such a wolf in sheep clothing. Uh, the culture has um, uh, given us the drag queen as this lovable, um, sweet creature, uh, this RuPaul kind of individual um, that has been around a long time but is now being shown to be benign, lovable, uh, actually, they are very dangerous, um, and that is not, maybe not for physical violence, but the agenda. Um, you know, this this comes uh, from the the embracing of the queer theory, which was Michel Foucault. Uh, Foucault call. Uh, he was this um, French uh, activist, 
And um, it really is an attack on Catholicism. Why? Because they saw this uh, hierarchy of sexual morals. And on the top was uh, heterosexual men and women. Well, as it should be, because that's how God created it. And they see the Catholic Church behind that. And at the bottom, they see, so they see the normal heterosexuals at the top of this sexual more, uh, the sexual moral pyramid. And at the bottom, they see the deviants, uh, the pedophiles, uh, bestiality. And their goal of this queer theory is to elevate this deviancy uh, up to the same level as normal. This is what's called the new normal. Um, into this new normal by eliminating laws against adult child sexual activity, animal wow. sexual relations. It's, it's mind boggling. And what this queer theory has done has picked drag queens to be their evangelists. They are not That's harmless insane. fun. They are an agenda. And people mocked me. People laughed at me. Um, I'm out there trying to awake, awaken us. Talk about awoke, be awoke, be awakened. This is the true meaning then of be awakened. Um, this is a wolf in sheep's clothing. And, mm. and, and people are bringing their children to libraries, letting them uh, be indoctrinated. This is, uh, this is very dangerous. But nobody is calling out the purpose of this drag queen. The purpose of the drag queen is very dangerous, very, very dangerous, and nobody is saying that, even in the midst of this controversy. And the thing is what people do also don't point out, and I did a talk on this on our Explaining the Faith series on Saturday mornings, every Saturday at 11, is the problem in the Catholic Church. Absolutely go to the Jenkins study out of Penn State, go to the John Jay report. The problem in the Catholic Church is not pedophilia, it's homosexuality. Yeah. A vast majority of those cases were post-puberty. Now, does that make it right? No, of course not. But these were these were um, mostly males, uh, 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 adolescents, post-puberty, uh, like 15, uh, 14, 15, 16, 17 years old. Still wrong, still decrepit, still absolutely right. But the media won't call it what it is. It's really a phobia. It yeah. is, it's a homosexual problem. It's not a pedophilia problem. There's almost very little pedophilia, but you can't say that because the media has already twisted it. Here's the real uh, stats, Joe. If you look it up, the real stats are 85% of abuse happens in the home. Mm. That, that's, a, that's a known fact, again, from the John Jay report from the Jenkins study. 14% happens in schools and religious, uh, or excuse me, schools and extracurricular. 1% happens in religious institutions. Of that, the Catholic Church is in the bottom half. Still wrong. We still need yeah. to fix it. But the, yeah. the perception is totally different. Yeah. Did you like that video? It's okay. You can admit it. It's perfectly fine. Hey, we cover the big stories of our day from inside the church to outside the church to all points in between. And we do it from a Catholic perspective. It's called a Catholic take. It's a radio program Monday through Friday. We live stream it right here on this channel, by the way. So make sure to subscribe, like, and share. We would be very grateful to you. And don't forget, you're going to want to watch this video right here because you don't want to miss anything.